It is so good because people are hardly gossiping. <laughs> they say everybody now is just language. Everybody, instead of gossiping, is just speaking about COVID-19, about coronavirus. So there's hardly any time to gossip. <laughs> Amen. So she's seeing some benefits. Amen. Uh, in this time. But the reality is COVID-19 or coronavirus has become the language of the day. Wherever you go, you go to the bank, you go to a man of shopping centers. Everywhere you go, you are reminded whenever you see people sanitizing, people wearing masks, amen, uh, uh, or people telling you to wash your hands, uh, it's on TV, it's on the internet, wherever you go, it's the language of today. And uh, my message is going to be a little bit based on that. And one thing that you and I cannot ignore about COVID-19 is that it has brought so much hurt and has hindered so many things. It has brought so much pain and tears. Lives have been lost. Many people have died as a result of COVID-19. The economies, amen, have stopped. People's income has been cut, amen. And uh, everything is going upside down during this crisis. People are living in fear. Some people don't even want to leave their home. Some people, amen, are so much afraid when they just have a flu or when they start coughing. They are wondering, am I having coronavirus or what? Right? People are so much in a state of being fe or fearful. It's difficult to travel and to see your family. Or sometimes it's not just fear for yourself. Sometimes you are fearful for your family members. You are worried. How are they doing now? Are they safe? Especially if it's in places like Vinduka or Walfish Bay. You hear your family is there. You start to get concerned. Want to read Amen? One verse of scripture. I want to say Amen. Not only did COVID 19 affect all these things. It has also affected Christians all over the world. When I heard that news, amen, about the church, one of our churches in America, it said the pastor plus 50 congregants, 50 people in his church, have tested positive for COVID-19. And therefore that church cannot open. And we see, amen, just how much the church has been affected. Matthew 12, verse 21, verse of scripture. The Bible says, A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send for the judgment unto victory. I want to speak to you a message I've entitled, A bruised reed. A bruised reed. The Bible says, A bruised reed, he shall not break, speaking about Jesus, and a waxing flax, or a smoking flax, he shall not quench. Now we know, he is quoting this verse, amen, Matthew, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew, he is quoting this verse from the prophecy Amen. In the book of Isaiah, I believe Isaiah 42 or 43, if I'm not mistaken, whereby he says, A bruised reed he shall not break, and a waxing flax he shall not quench. Now, basically, what a bruised reed is, a bruised reed is speaking about, you can think about a plant like this, amen. You see this plant? This one is dead. Let me take you know, when a plant is about to die, 
and he starts to break like this, right? You know, almost like those things in the Mahabu field. And it's just like this. How many know this is as good as dead? You just break it off. Because it proves it's about to die. Now what the Bible is saying is uh, a bruised tree he shall not break. In other words, uh, when Jesus sees a tree broken like this about to die, he will not break it. Ah, let's just kill it. He will not do that. He will leave it. And he says uh, a smoking flax. In other words, how many of you, you know, probably you've tried, amen. Or oh, you still do, I don't know, you know, sometimes also do, do a little bit of fire. You know, you uh, fire, sometimes you know, the fire is about to die because of the wood. And some people just give up. You know, this fire is about to die. It's just throw water. The Bible is saying when Jesus sees fire doesn't even smoke, there's no flames, he will not put that fire out. A bruised reed, he shall not break, and a smoking flax, he shall not quench. And I'm here to speak about, amen, like I said, many things have been bruised. Many things, amen, have been bruised by COVID-19. Number one, I want to speak about uh, a bruised uh, faith. Many children of God, the reality is, amen, our faith uh, has been bruised uh, during this pandemic. Our faith, amen, uh, probably your Bible reading uh, has been bruised uh, during this time of COVID-19. Your Bible reading looks exactly like that's this little plan that I've taken for you. Your prayer life looks like this. It's bruised, amen. Check one, two. One, two, one, two. One, two, check. One, two. That's too much volume. So if we look at prayer lives, amen, they might be bruised. It could just be like this little plant, amen. This could be the state of many children of God, amen, and their prayer lives. Or they are Bible reading. And the reality, this is the reality, amen. This is not simply just saying, you know what, hey, COVID-19 is nothing on me. Well, one way or another, your faith might have been bruised by during this pandemic. You started, you stopped, amen, believing God for the impossible. The other like I preached the other time, you stopped looking, amen, for answers from God. Now our focus is just, amen, on, you know, sanitizing, amen, washing my hands. All that is good. I'm not saying don't do that. But what I'm saying is, amen, now we start to look for solutions elsewhere. Forgetting that, amen, our biggest solution, our biggest answer to the problem is God. Our witnessing has been bruised. We don't witness for God. And if our witnessing life was alive, it would look like this. If our prayer life was alive, it would look like this. 
our generosity, our giving to God has been bruised. And I know, amen, many things have been messed up during this time, but not only those things have been messed up, not only our physical life, amen, but our spiritual life has been deeply affected. So you and I, our faith has been tempered with somehow during this time. Our faith, amen, has been played with. Our faith has been affected. And if you are an honest, you know, I was speaking about people who live on cloud nine, okay? People who live on uh, spiritual cloud nine. You may know some people that are close back to Jesus. They live next door to Jesus. They're always on fire. I'm not speaking about such people. If you're one of those, amen, just tell us, you know, after service, we'll worship you. But I'm speaking about real life. I'm speaking about reality. And in real life and in reality, amen, if you are a real person, if you are a, a, a real child of God that's honest, your life, your spiritual life would have been affected during this time. Your spiritual life, amen, would have been touched one way or another by this crisis. Second, I'm going to speak about a bruised church. Now, one thing that's amazing is many people have somehow misunderstood, amen, the identity or the importance of the church. And uh, when the government says, you know what, uh, the church is not an essential service, it rings something in our minds. It's a message, amen, uh, that is being communicated to young people and people start to understand, you know what, church is not really that important. We can actually live without church. But that's the aim of the devil. He wants you and I to believe that the church is not really as important as we think it is. That's what the devil, but I want to tell you, amen, the church is a living being. The Bible calls the church the bride of Christ. But people are getting confused, say, no, 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 I am the church. <laughs> I am the church. Well, that's a misinterpretation of scripture. When Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, now, number one, you need to understand, who was he saying to? The church of Corinth, the Corinthians. And if you study out that word in Greek, which Paul is writing in, when he's saying, you are the church, you are the temple of God, what is about that word you then is plural. Okay? It's almost like me going in and saying you standard bank. No one was saying you standard bank, so just speaking about the manager. He's speaking about the manager, he's speaking about the tellers, it's speaking about uh, the consultants, it's speaking about everybody. Right? So it's you you can say you, but you are actually speaking about everybody else. That's exactly what the church is. When Paul is saying that you are the church, he's not just speaking about one person. What he's speaking about is collectively, amen, you are the church. When you are alone, you are not the church. If you are alone, you are just you. And we call you by your name. But the moment you join with the body of Christ, amen, then you are the church now. That's why Paul said, amen, just as the body has many functions, that is exactly how the church is. One is the head, the other is the arms, the other is the legs, and together we work. So don't be confused by people who tell you, no, don't worry, you are the church. Just stay at home and pray, sing, and sleep. It's a lie, amen. But the church 
has been bruised. The image of the church, amen, has been tempered with. And now people look at church, amen, very differently. I was watching a clip of Julius Malema. How many of you know Julius Malema? Julius Malema is saying, you know what, hey, the church must not open. Just close the church. If you are a really good, loving pastor, just close your church. Doors. Don't open it. If you are a really real man of God. Well, Julius Malema is, doesn't know what he's talking about. But I don't blame him. Because uh, during this lockdown, and the church being locked down, somehow it seemed, you know what, hey, it's not really a big deal to be a church. And how many know, many people have been having this idea already. It's not a big deal to be a church. It's not a big deal if I miss a service. Some people can even go for years. I, I have brothers, amen. I have brothers probably for 10 years. They have not been in a church. Some of them, the only time they came to church after a long, long, long time is when I got married. It's time they came. Don't even have church clothes. Or official clothes, rather. <laughs> they just come, you know. One of them is in my wedding pictures. He's just wearing, <laughs> you know, a t-shirt, a shorty. He's excited. But that is uh, the image now that many people in this generation growing up from here will have in their mind. Church is not really important. It's not a big deal. The other is uh, the, important of, the importance of church as a building. Now many people don't really understand the power of the church building. They think, ah, <laughs> it's just a building. It's not just a building. Okay? And if that has been your mind from now on, change that mentality. Isn't that the church building is not just a building? It's something holy. It's something that is sanctified. You can't just say, ah, it's just, no, no, it's not just a building. When there's a worship being held in it, it's not just a building. When we are serving God in it, it's not just a building. And you know what? As we've been reading the book of Exodus, most of you have realized how specific God was about building the temple. God is specific. You measure like this, and that's how serious God takes the church. He makes sure everything is in order. When you build, don't just use any material. Build like this and do like this. And all that is expressing, amen, the importance of the church building. No, the building is not really important. No, the building is important. Where you go to go serve God is really important. That's why Jesus said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. He's making it personal. My house. I will build my church. Build. Amen. My church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. The building of the church, when you enter into the building of the church, your attitude has to change. Your behavior has to change. It's not just a home. It's not just a man. Your room. It's not just any other place. It's a church building. But many people today, their attitude toward the church building has been messed up. See, I don't know about here, but you know, in two men, people have so much disrespected the church building that uh, some people can even just go behind you know the building and start to be because to them it's, it's, it's just a building so you can just be on the church building and don't care but the church building was supposed to be something that you honor 
Especially when you enter inside. There have been records of people, amen. He said, brother, the pastor is preaching. He takes out his phone. He's watching pornography in the church building. In the church building, amen. We don't even have to put up signs like that. We don't even have to put up a sign like, you know, do not put your phone on silent, please. No, no. It ought to be automatic. I mean, when people go in the banks, they switch off their phone. The bank is not even a holy place. When people go into classrooms, amen, they are at their best behavior, but the class is not even a holy place. But the church, amen, this is the house of God. It's where God dwells, and it's where we feel the presence of God. And if this place, amen, there's a sense of an unholy atmosphere in here, there's no way we can feel the presence of God in this place. At the moment, amen, the atmosphere is filled with prayer. The moment the atmosphere of, of the church building, amen, is filled with worship, then we can be able to feel the presence of God. The church has been reduced. See, the church is not just there, amen, to do, you know, a, a low profile things. The church is there to make an impact. We want to change people's lives. We want to change people's livelihood. We want people to become better once they have started coming to church. Somebody must come to church and say, you know what, I used to be like this, so now I'm like this. And that is a testimony, and that is the impact of the church. Thirdly, amen, the hope that we get here is, Jesus Christ is saying, a bruised reed I will not break. A waxing flax I will not quench. That is the hope, amen, that you and I can have this morning. That no matter how bruised your faith has been, no matter how bad your prayer life has been, no matter how bad, amen, your Bible reading, your faithfulness, everything seems to be crumbling down. You feel like you are half bad smitten. I'm here to tell you, amen, Jesus Christ will not break you off. He still loves you, he still cares for you, and you'll be patient with him. A Bruce Lee, he will not break. A smoking flax, maybe your fire for God, you are losing it. You don't get excited, amen, about the things of God anymore. God will not just give up on you. Your smoke is about to go out for Jesus. You feel like giving up. But he said, you know what? Hey, listen, a smoking flax. I will not quench. God will not give up on you. God will not just blow you off and say, you know what? I'm done. He's struggling too much. She's struggling a lot. Look at their life. It's a mess. Look at the things they do. They pretend too much. No. God will not break a, a, a bruised reed and you will not quench a waxing flex. Doesn't matter, amen. It can be your finances that have been bruised. Jesus Christ is saying, amen, there is still hope for your finances. Maybe it's relationships, it can be marriage, it can be friendship relationships that have been bruised. There is still hope. It can be your faith, amen, that has been bruised. There is still faith, there is still hope. See, Jesus Christ will help you find a way again. Amen. Now, we look at this, amen. It looks impossible for this flower to come to life again. But how many you know Jesus said one thing? Here, after Jesus is calling this rich young ruler, and this man says, Oh Lord, I want to be your disciple. And Jesus tells him, Okay. You know the commandments. Honor them. <coughs> and then he says, Yes, I have been keeping all the commandments from my youth. 
and she said that's true when one thing you like sell everything you have come and follow me and this man said I can't do that and he walked away sorrowfully and Jesus looked at that man and said how difficult it is or how hard it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God it's easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And then the disciples were shocked. Says, but then it's impossible. Who then can be saved? And Jesus told him one thing: it is impossible with men. But with God, all things are possible. It doesn't matter, amen. How many times, amen, or how bad your faith has been bruised. It doesn't matter, amen, how bad you have gone deep into sin. It doesn't matter, amen, how many times you have messed up, amen, with God. All things are possible. Don't think, oh no, Pastor, for me, I cannot just live right. For me, I've messed up big time. I'm here to tell you, amen. It might be impossible in your eyes, but with God, all things are possible. Amen. If we were to say this thing will become a lie, all of us here will say impossible. <laughs> but with God, nothing is impossible. This can be the state of your faith right now. This could be the state of your spiritual life right now. Spiritually look like this from. So you know my pastor. I've not been reading my Bible for, for a while now. I haven't been studying my Bible. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't really been praying seriously. I haven't really, you know, I, I haven't really seek for God genuinely. And your faith, or you yourself, spiritually, you are bruised. Oh, your fire is about to go out. You say, you know what? I'm just trying my best. Well, stop trying your best and give it all to Jesus. Because Jesus is saying, Amen, a bruised I will not break it. And no matter how much your fire is going out, my brother, my sister, God will help you find a way back. In the book of uh, Corinthians, First Corinthians, I believe, is saying, Here is uh, Paul advising Christians that you know what? Whenever we are tempted, God always finds a way of escape for you and I. And that is a man uh, to say for every problem, God will make you be able to identify a solution. Every problem has a solution. And uh, you and I can begin to start to water the bruised reed. Water it, amen. You see, you're about to die, water it today. You see, your fire is about to go out, amen. Uh, uh, add, more, add more oil to the fire. Like that famous song says, uh, give me oil in my lamp and keep me burning. So you, Jesus, feel with your Holy Spirit. Amen. So my fire can start to burn. Because it may seem impossible with men, but with God, all things are possible. And God will never give up on you. Amen. I don't care how, many, how this lockdown has affected you badly. Maybe it has affected you financially, in your relationships, amen, in your health, probably. Things are going down. But God is saying, just because things are at the point whereby they look impossible, does not mean I'm done with you. Just because things have gone so bad, I mean, sometimes, amen, there are situations in our lives, amen, that we think are impossible. There are things in our lives we have come to a point where we say, no, this is impossible. Nothing can help. And sometimes, guess what? Sometimes we don't even want to pray about those things. We skip them. It's too much for God. 
I'm fine with it. Pray about it, no. Pray about getting a good job, no. It's too much for God. Pray about this thing in your life to change, no. It's, it's not really necessary. Because you look at your situation like this. And you say, it's hopeless. It's useless. But Jesus Christ is saying, and Bruce Reed, I will not break. Just because it looks impossible, I will not come and say, ah, it's already done. Let's just, yeah, it's done. <laughs> but Jesus won't do that. I remember him, man, my grandfather. I don't know where he got that idea from. You know, sometimes the tree, one branch is like it's about to die. What do you do? Just take and chop. Bam! It's gone. Or you will cut everything off and it's just a stump left. But Jesus Christ will not give up on you. There is still hope. It's about us and close. Amen. One to pray to God.